has been dying of slow death, in case you haven't noticed. It's been many years now, and it's become more noticeable in the past decade or so. In the early 2000s, comedian Stephen Colbert picked up on this cultural phenomena by coining the term truthiness, which went on to become Marion Webster's Word of the Year in 2006. In 2016, in the wake of our presidential election, Brexit, and accusations across the political spectrum about fake news, Oxford dictionaries named post-truth, a hyphenated word, its word of the year. Shortly thereafter, commenting on the presidential inauguration, Kellyanne Conway famously spoke of alternative facts. In response, time blazed into the question, is truth dead on its April 3rd, 2017 cover? A recent story for The Economist, an international magazine, was entitled, Yes, I Lied to You in the Post-Truth World. The article analyzed the dishonesty that's wreaking havoc in politics, journalism, social media, and many other areas of our common life. One expert quoted in the article said, right now, it pays to be outrageous, but not truthful. The articles also highlighted one of the most effective ways to tell lies, by hiding the truth in a glut of information. Information glut is the new censorship, they said, through the University of North Carolina as they did a study, adding that other governments are now employing tactics like this. China's authorities, for instance, do not try and censor everything on the internet or on social media. They just flood them with distracting and alternative information. So we no longer live in a world where there is ultimate objective truth, according to most folks. We live in the world where there's only your opinion and there's my opinion. So it's very hard to know the truth about anything in our world today. <clears throat> and yet, as believers, we are called to remember and pro pro proclaim God's word as the truth, still trustworthy and forever outside of us all, the plumb line of right and wrong. This leads us to Second John. You know, Pilate in the Gospel of John, as he's talking to Jesus, as you've had read to you, he raises this truth even then. What is truth? In Second John, we read this. The elder, to the lady chosen by God, and to her children whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and in love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and that this is, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have come out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. 
Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. John begins his letter here, his short epistle with a greeting to the believing community and he calls himself the elder because he was a very old man and probably the last surviving apostle when he wrote these words. He addresses the note to the lady chosen by God and to her children and most uh, com commenters and uh, um, most scholars believe that this was a way of speaking of the local church it's called personification. The language of the letter lends itself to that. And at the end of the letter, he writes, The children of your sister, who is chosen of God, send their greetings. It's hard to believe he, he would send greetings from their nieces and nephews. It's also true that throughout the Bible, God's people are personified in female terms. Israel was called a virgin, the daughter of Zion, and a mother. The church is called the Bride of Christ, so the, the lady chosen by God was one of the churches of Asia Minor, her children, its individual members, and her chosen sister, the neighboring church from which John was writing, and the children of your sister, its members. The far more importance to us today is what he says about the church. He says he loves them in the truth. This applies not only to himself, but all who know the truth. And he says he loves them because of the truth which lives in us, lives in us, and will be with us forever. Even God's grace, mercy, and peace will only be with us in truth and love. We would have to be blind not to see how truth and love are interwoven here. Truth is the foundation of our love for one another, the truth about Christ. We love each other not because we're compatible or because we're naturally drawn to one another, but because of the truth we all share of the Lordship of Christ. Not only have we come to know it and believe it, but it lives in us. It's, it's become an indwelling force. And it will be with us forever. So long as that truth endures in us and with us, then our love will endure. We won't increase the love we have for one another by compromising the truth we hold in common. Now, what we have in the remainder of this letter is the working out of these two inseparables, truth and love. How does this work out in our life together as God's people? How does this work out in relationship to others who deny the truth? So often, we sacrifice one for the other. Sometimes we hold fast to the truth, but we do so in a way that sacrifices love. We champion the truth in a cold, harsh, and arrogant fashion. We take the words of Scripture and we use them as a weapon for one another, toward one another. We load our Scripture cannons and we point them at our opponent and we pull the trigger or light the fuse and let it fly. Oh. Yes, what an effect that has. When I was uh, much younger and in seminary, I had a friend who had, was a graduate of Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. And uh, at the time, those folks were required to have so many uh, hours of witnessing to the community. And so what they would do, some of the students, is they would take tracks, you know, printed tracks, and they would wrap them in colored cellophane, put a rubber band around them, take a handful of them, walk by the local bar, 
and heave them in. They called them the Moody Gospel Bomb. I'm sure that had a lot of good effect, don't you? 